seminar is open to everyone because everybody presents here and there. But we, we really think this is important that we don't get into trouble and, and we really know how to use material that may not belong to us. So that's why we ask our two speakers to do it. So enjoy. And with that, I'm going to introduce Michael Ladish first. Uh, he's a scholarly communications officer and program lead at the University of California Davis Library. He provides guidance and support to UC Davis researchers on issues related to scholarly communications, creates educational and outreach materials about intellectual property issues and provides consultative services regarding scholarly work permissions. He also serves as a primary spokesperson regarding all aspects of scholarly publishing, barrier-free access to knowledge, changing scholarly credit mechanisms, and new modes of knowledge creation. And then we have also Eric Fausak. Eric is a librarian at the Health Sciences Library at UC Davis as well, uh, who predominantly serves the School of Veterinary Medicine. He is a registered veterinary technician and extremely interested in evidence-based veterinary medicine. He's the outgoing chair of the Animal and Veterinary Information Specialist Caucus of the Medical Library Association and chair of the website and membership steering committee for the Evidence-Based Veterinary Medical Association. And on a personal note, I've been in contact with both of them, um, particularly I, I asked Eric for help not long ago, and, and these two guys are, are a world of knowledge. So let's listen to them, and, and we are very fortunate to have you guys. And with that, the podium is yours. All right, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Paco, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I feel honored to uh, be able to speak to you about copyright considerations. Um, just one more remark um, before I start. Um, I always try to connect with the audience somehow, um, especially if, if we are on Zoom, so I don't even see you, I don't know who's there. Um, but I want to let you know that my career started actually way back after school as a dairy farmer. And uh, as a dairy farmer, of course, you work closely with veterinarians, so I'm uh, a little bit knowledgeable, but not as much anymore because things have changed, of course, for, uh, over, uh, over time. Um, but uh, so I, I'm especially delighted to, to talk to your, um, to this audience and to uh, veterinarians um, about, uh, yeah, about co a copyright consideration. And the title is um, a Copyright Considerations for Webinars and Beyond. And the emphasis is really on beyond because um, a lot of things that I'm, everything basically that I'm talking about applies to um, uh, publishing, applies to instruction and material you might show your, um, your students or provide for your students. Um, but it also pro, um, applies to webinars or presentations that you might give in uh, in person. So when I when I finished this presentation, I was I was looking through and I, I realized the word webinar doesn't really appear very often here, if at all, in my on my slide. So don't be worried. I might mention this uh, once in a while, um, but it is about um, the copyright law as we know it. Um, and uh, it is about exceptions to the copyright law, which uh, is called fair use and how to apply this. And this applies again to um, all kinds of areas where you might um, use material that is copyrighted, uh, which includes webinars. So, um, but uh, then let me just start. And um, my first slide is a copyright statement. Um, so at the bottom, you see the C, the copyright C, 
um, uh, 2021 Michael Ladish. That means this presentation is copyrighted uh, to me. So I, I'm the copyright owner. And I come uh, to this copyright statement a little bit later um, again and explain it a little bit further. Um, a second um, thing that I want to show you before I uh, really dive in here um, is that I'm not an attorney. So I was a dairy farmer, as I said. Um, I'm not speaking the capacity as a dairy farmer. And I'm also, um, I, I was a, I'm a librarian. So I, I was a librarian all my, all my life, but I don't have a legal, um, a legal degree. Um, and uh, my knowledge and my expertise in copyright is um, through courses, through consultations, through um, reading and so on. Um, and and uh, I think I, I have a certain level of expertise, um, but uh, again, I'm not an attorney. And because I'm not that, uh, I don't provide legal advice. So I cannot, uh, you cannot, say in court at some point, Michael told me this is this. No, that uh, it's all to the best of my knowledge. It's guidance that I provide. And um, yeah, that that's basically it. So the only people actually on, uh, on in university who can do really legal advice, yes, you can do or you cannot do this, um, are campus counsel or general counsel and these kind of folks who are, who are hired as lawyers by uh, institutions. So, um, having said this, I'm, I continue now with the outline. Um, we, uh, I, will, I will talk about the U.S. copyright law. And uh, I put the U.S. in bold um, because it's uh, important, of course, to know, um, or it, you can assume that, uh, everybody would assume that, uh, that each country has their own copyright law. So um, I um, heard that you, the audience here might not be all US who might have people from Canada and from other countries as well. Um, so uh, the things that I'm talking about is US law and in your country, it might be slightly different. There are, the copyright laws internationally are sort of streamlined a little bit because um, uh, we, have, um, we, we have agreements with other uh, countries um, about uh, the duration of copyright law, for example. This is um, pretty much the same everywhere. Um, but there are, there are slightly, um, slight differences um, in, uh, in different countries and uh, you need to uh, apply, of course, the law of the country you are in. Um, in terms of webinars, and I might, uh, um, I, I, might, I might point this out here, um, this is then a, a sort of an international uh, audience here. And uh, what I'm saying here, or what I'm showing here in the webinar um, is covered under US copyright law, because I'm sitting here in Sacramento, I'm not in Davis uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, so I'm covered under, um, or I have to apply the US copyright law. If you are in a conference uh, in, in, in person, for example, you are a US citizen um, and you go to Spain for a conference and you present material, you have to uh, check the Spanish uh, copyright law in order to um, apply uh, this uh, appropriately. So that is something, so there are some differences internationally. Um, but I speak about US copyright law. Uh, then I was, uh, so first there will be a, a short introduction about this. Uh, then um, it's the fair use doctrine. And this is the most important part um, of the copyright law for the use of material um, that is copyrighted. Um, the use of this material without permission. So the US has actually a relatively flexible and relatively liberal uh, approach to copyright. So they allow the use of um, copyrighted material under certain, certain circumstances and they're quite broad. Uh, so as a person who does a webinar, as an author, as, a, um, as an instructor, um, you can do quite a bit under the umbrella under the umbrella of uh, fair use. So fair use is your best friend here. Um, then I will um, say a little bit about fair use for authors, fair use for instructors, how to protect your own work, um, not only how you use other works, but also how to protect your own work and how to obtain permission um, if you uh, want to or have to do this. 
So the US copyright law um, is uh, in effect since 1978. It was um, passed in, in Congress in 1976 as the US Copyright Act, uh, Title VII of US Code. Um, it's a revision of the 1909 uh, copyright law. So that's where the 50 years came in. It's not every 50 years, it could be more than that, you know. So, um, and the current one is in effect since 76. So um, it's quite a while, but it takes um, some several decades until it is really uh, completely changed. However, there are always amendments um, added to the law and um, one need to be uh, up to date in, um, in, in checking what, what's new, um, what uh, lawmakers, what Congress have uh, added to the copyright law. This is often reflecting new developments in technology, new developments in uh, distribution. Um, so there was an amendment in 1996, um, I think, that uh, sort of reflected uh, the, um, the the upcoming of the internet, where things are much easily, much uh, quicker being distributed, and this needed to be reflected in uh, um, in a copyright law as well. Um, the U.S. copyright law is a federal law, so all suits are in federal court. Individual states have also copyright laws, but they are not. Um, as, as important, at least for our uh, purposes here. Um, and uh, the main precedents um, for, for copyright uh, laws are all in federal court up to the Supreme Court. And then uh, here's a link to the uh, current version of the code if you want to read it. It's not that long, actually. Um, so the copyright law, the description of the law um, was, is a, is a quote by Sandra Day O'Connor, Supreme Court uh, Justice uh, several years ago. And she said it um, actually quite nicely. Uh, the primary objective of copyright is not to reward the labor of authors, but to promote the progress in, of science and useful arts. So the copyright law is not primarily to protect um, the work of, of people. Um, the protection is um, granted to creators of uh, works of uh, intellectual property um, because um, as, as an as incentive to produce um, works, intellectual property, um, but in exchange, um, these works uh, can be used and should be used to build freely upon the ideas and information con conveyed by a work. So it's basically encouraging um, uh, to create things, to invent things um, in order to uh, progress the science and the useful arts. The subject matter um, of the copyright, so what is protected, um, it's uh, original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression. And the tangible medium of expression is important here um, because as long as it's not um, being recorded, written down, um, uh, performed or whatever, if it's long as it's just in your head, um, it's not protected by copyright. It needs to be um, fixed in a tangible medium. Um, and so I, I thought of an example, and maybe if you have an idea how to eradicate rabies, rabies in the world, um, and you tell this to a colleague, that's not, co uh, not covered by copyright yet. Um, but if you write it down uh, in an article or in a book, um, which then will probably be very successful, um, then it is covered by uh, copyright. So the works of authorship include uh, all these categories that are listed here. And the literary works, um, we also cover basically the, the scholarly publications. Um, that's a little bit unfortunate. And actually, academics a lot uh, complain a lot uh, that uh, research results or, or scholarly expressions, uh, academic expressions, are not uh, being listed here. Um, they do a lot about uh, they, they go through lengths uh, to mention musical works, of course, dramatic works, um, pictorial, graphic, uh, photographs, motion pictures, of course, sound recordings. The copyright law is a big thing, it plays a big, big role um, in the entertainment industry, as you can imagine, um, because there are 
big, uh, there's big money involved. Um, but uh, of course, it applies to um, works that um, have been produced or created by uh, scholars um, or instructors as well. And then there's, there uh, are things that are not protected by copyright law. Um, so any idea, procedure, process system, method of operation, and so on and so on. So facts are not, um, are not protected. And I have here an example. I have uh, through my slides sometimes uh, links on the more on the right hand side um, to court decisions. Um, about uh, that are precedents um, uh, about copyright uh, law and the application of fair use, for example. Um, but this is one uh, where a, um, a, a publisher um, was reprinting a, a phone book um, for from a phone company in, uh, I forgot it was Kansas or Kentucky, one of the K states. Um, and uh, the, the telephone company sued them and said, you cannot, um, you cannot reproduce this because this is our, um, this is covered by copyright, this is our property. Um, and the court, the Supreme Court actually decided, no, it is not because uh, a phone book um, is just a list of names and phone numbers. There is no uh, creativity in there. Um, this is just a list of facts. So um, this is not covered by uh, copyright and you can, everyone can use it uh, any way they want. So that, that, that's important. Another example would be if you take the temperature outside every day um, and um, make, make a list out of it. Um, it's not really a, a co protected by copyright because the temperature is a fact and, and it's not uh, copyrightable. Um, if you write an, um, an article about it because and explain why the temperature goes up every, uh, every day or goes down or whatever and put some intellectual um, work in there and, and put it out in a tangible uh, a fixed tangible medium, then it is protected by copyright. Also not protected words, phrases, familiar symbols, titles, uh, book titles, for example, or film titles. Uh, works by the US government, that's important. So everything that the US government is um, releasing is uh, free of copyright, so we can use it any way you want. Um, this doesn't apply to states, so, but states have individual, um, individual right. And so if you want to uh, use uh, California, um, uh, uh, things that are released by the, by the California state government, um, then you uh, better double check if you uh, can do uh, or not. And then there are works in the public domain that are not protected. And the public domain um, is uh, material that uh, where the copyright has expired. So this is before 1925 now, um, and uh, or where the copyright owner failed to follow copyright renewal rules, rules or where the copyright owner deliberately placed the um, material into the public domain. Um, copyright uh, law does not uh, protect uh, this type of work. Um, right, so this, this is free to use and uh, public domain material is often being found in like Internet Archive, in uh, data, image databases, um, in uh, YouTube sometimes. Um, so uh, then uh, at the bottom is a link to a Cornell website that explains the public domain question pretty well. So then we come to the duration of the copyright. That's also important um, when you want to use material um, in a webinar or wherever. Um, it has been extended in 1998. And um, this it was extended to 70 years after the death of the author. So um, something, a work gets into the public domain and doesn't have copyright uh, protection anymore after 70 years after the uh, author has passed away. It was 50 years only. And uh, for corporations, it's slightly different in any case. And so this um, extension act was uh, then nicknamed the Mickey Mouse Protection Act because um, it uh, was, introduced at a time when the protection, the copyright protection for the Mickey Mouse cartoon character uh, was about to expire. And, and Disney was lobbying heavily with the help of other, um, other big entertainment uh, industry players 
um, to extend that. Um, now, uh, so Mickey Mouse is still protected, but in 2024, this will expire as well. And I doubt that Disney will go um, and lobby again because they make uh, their revenues from other things and the character doesn't play such a big role anymore. Um, so exclusive rights and copyrighted work. So if a work is copyrighted, you have exclusive rights as a copyright owner to do certain things, to make copies of the work. Only the copyright owner is allowed to do this. Um, make derivative works based on the original works. And derivative works could be translation of a book. It could be a toy uh, based on a cartoon character like Mickey Mouse again. Um, movie script, it could be an audio book made out of a, um, of a novel, for example. Then distribute the work, perform the work, display the work that the last two uh, really uh, apply more to, to the, again, to the entertainment industry. Um, the copyright owner may transfer some or all of the rights to others. So that's what often happens, of course, in publishing, um, where the uh, copyright owner, the author, um, signs a publishing agreement with the publisher and transfers the exclusive copyrights um, to, to the publisher. And then only the publisher um, can make copies and distribute the work and, and so on. And the, the author doesn't have any rights anymore. I come to this uh, a little bit later in the talk uh, again, in order to, um, to, to help to clarify how um, a, a, an author could keep the copyright and uh, to, um, to, to be able to distribute the work um, him or herself. So, um, yeah, I apologize that the uh, slides are very text heavy sometimes, and uh, I don't want to read through all of this, and I don't expect you to do this uh, right now. Again, I will um, send these the slides to Rafaela, and she will uh, distribute them so you can uh, dive in later if you want to. Um, but this is the text of the fair use um, clause uh, in the copyright law. So the copyright law has some limitations. So the protection is not absolute. There are several present, uh, uh, limitations to the copyright law. One of them, and the most important one um, for our purposes in, in academia and in scholarly communication, um, is the fair use one. That That's the whole thing already. So that, that's not more. It's more than that. This is just like really a short uh, piece of, um, of legislation here. Um, but it says that for purposes um, uh, such as criticism, comment, new re news reporting, teaching, including uh, classroom use, scholarship or research, um, it is not an infringement of copyright if you uh, use material that is copyrighted without permission. If um, you uh, consider the four factors uh, of fair use and uh, positively sort of apply them. And I go through these four factors because they're really important. Um, the uh, copyright law doesn't provide any red lines, any really hard numbers um, in what you can do and what you cannot do. So I come back to the, when I come back to the amount, for example, um, you, there, there is often an assumption that you can uh, copy like 10% of a book or 20% or one chapter or uh, 10 pages or so. This is not from the copyright law. The copyright law is way more vague um, and uh, always um, depends on the situation and depends on the circumstances. The favorite, the favorite two words for, for copyright um, uh, librarians, copyright offices, people like me is it depends. Um, because every situation is slightly different and uh, the four factors need to be applied um, in order to decide if you uh, covered under fair use. Um, without the fair use doctrine, basically all copying for any purpose would not be allowed. So it would be an infringement of copyright law. So fair use is really, really important. Um, there are other exceptions um, besides fair use. So there's exceptions, for example, for people with disabilities, uh, who people who have uh, problems with, uh, with their eyes. So you can uh, create a copy uh, of a book with, um, with bigger 
characters with bigger letters, for example, and this is not an infringement of copyright. Uh, there are also copyright um, uh, exceptions for libraries, so we can make copies for interlibrary loan to send around. So, the, but again, the fair use is the most significant. Um, it's um, intentionally vague, so it, it can be stretched quite far and um, it can be frustrating for uh, people to decide, is this now fair use or is it not fair use? Because of course it would be easier if somebody tells you, yes, you can use it or you cannot. Um, but it always depends on the circumstances. And uh, people have, uh, of course, uh, we are all human, we are all different. People have different levels of comfort and, and of boldness. Some people say, well, okay, I cover this under fair use and you just try me. And other people are more careful. They say, well, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe I better not use this material because maybe, maybe there's a chance I get in trouble. So, um, so the whole range um, is possible. Um, and um, I hope uh, after this talk, there's a little bit more clarification how you um, decide, how you make decisions um, and encourage you to make decisions in a positive way. I'm, I'm more of a bold person in this case. Um, there are no quantitative, uh, quantitative limits, I said this already. Um, and uh, you need, yeah, you need to, to consider the four factors. Um, no one factor is deciding and every case is different. So, and I give you a few examples here um, that you, um, that hopefully illustrates um, how, how this works. So the fourth, the, the first factor of uh, the, the factors to consider is something can be covered under fair use. Fair use again, is the use of copyrighted material without the permission of the copyright holder. So if you have permission from the copyright holder, that's a completely different game. Um, but without the permission of the copyright holder. So um, leaning towards fair use is, of course, scholarly and educational purposes. So most of you, uh, I don't know if we can say most, but many of you um, are working in an academic setting, in an uh, academic institution. Um, so anything you do, research and so on, is uh, leading towards fair use. Um, then uh, transformative uh, use is also leaning it if you do something else with the material than what is intended to do. So um, an example would be text mining, for example. You have a novel, which would be uh, co covered under copyright, um, but you um, do, a, do text mining in order to say, okay, they also use this specific term uh, so many times. Um, this is a different use of the material. That's a non-consumptional use. Um, so you don't read the uh, novel as it intended to, to be, um, but this would be, uh, if you use it some, for something else, it would be covered under uh, fair use. Uh, socially beneficial, that's also important, and uh, not for profit. Um, leaning away from fair use is um, if the work is simply duplicated and if it is used for profit, but use for profit is not necessarily it doesn't mean necessarily it cannot be fair use. So an example that I have here, and it comes up uh, a couple of time, uh, times in other slides, um, is, uh, is a court decision um, about uh, posters by, uh, concert posters um, by the uh, California band Grateful Dead. So if you are from California, uh, live in California, you should know about them. They were very, uh, very important rock band uh, at the time, and they're still a big following. Um, and uh, they have an archive, and they uh, they created when they whenever they went on concert tour, they created wonderful um, uh, posters that were plastered all over the place. So this was all before internet. So there was yes, of course, there was no uh, Facebook post or, or tweet about the concert coming up. Um, this was all like plastered on the walls. Um, and um, but the, the publisher Dorling Kindersley um, wanted to um, publish a book that was sort of a biography, the history of Grateful Dead, and he also wanted to include um, uh, images of the uh, of the concert posters. And uh, Billy Graham, who represents the the archive uh, or represented at this time the archive of um, the Grateful Dead. Uh, didn't give permission. So no, um, you, you, I, I don't know if he wanted a fee or not. Uh, anyway, um, no. Um, but the Supreme Court, no, the uh, Second Circuit Court decided, yes, uh, they 
the publisher can use it, even if it is for profit, because they want to sell the book, um, because uh, the other factors um, that, uh, for fair use um, apply here. And I come to this when we are coming to the other factors. So not always uh, for profit doesn't always mean, no, it's not uh, covered under fair use, it can be. Um, the second factor is the, the lowest one or the, the least important one, say like this, is the nature of the copyright work. And here, um, the leaning towards uh, the fair use is work that has been published um, that contains little or not creative impressions and contains mostly factual information. So here again, uh, research, scientific research, academia, uh, or scholarly communications, uh, scholarly publishing, um, this lean user leaning towards fair use. So um, novels, uh, again, or, or fictional work, um, using a fictional work um, is uh, less uh, likely to be covered under fair use. And uh, leaning away is work that has never been published. But here again is an uh, exception, uh, are exceptions. It's not always uh, clear cut. Um, so Harper uh, and Rowe, for example, wanted to publish a, the um, autobiography of uh, John Ford, uh, Gerald Ford, the president. Um, and uh, the nation, uh, the, the paper, the, the magazine, the nation published an excerpt of it uh, before Harper and Rowe was able to put out the book. And uh, this excerpt um, in, in a very short paragraph only um, explained uh, why or, or reprinted why Gerald Ford pardoned uh, Richard Nixon back then. And Harper and Rowe argued, well, this is like a spoiler. What we, he didn't, they didn't say spoiler, but this is what we consider a spoiler today. So this is the heart of the work. That's the most important part um, of, the, of, the, uh, of the autobiography. And people will buy uh, this book because they want to know why um, Ford um, did this. And the nation basically spoiled it. And we have a uh, big harm uh, in our um, in, in, on our market because now uh, several people will not buy the book anymore. And they won. So uh, it's an unpublished work, um, but uh, the uh, fair use clause still um, didn't uh, didn't cover the nation. Um, so they could not use it under the fair use clause and say, well, it's an unpublished work. That's not going to work. Um, the third one, and here we come to the bright red line, uh, is the amount and the sustain uh, substantiality of the use. So only limited uh, portions are used. Um, that's leaning towards fair use. Um, it's not the heart of the work here. Again, um, it's the John Ford book. Um, the amount used is not more than needed to achieve the stated purpose. So that's, that's something that you always need to consider, be it a webinar, be it material that you give to, the, to your students, be it um, an article or a book you want to publish. Um, use only what you need for um, making the point that you want to make. Um, making, um, use only the material that's necessary to, um, to, to achieve the stated purpose of the uh, of the use, um, images, uh, graphics, for example, if they are um, if they are have a lower resolution, if they are smaller, here you know, the Billy Graham uh, issue comes in again, um, will also be probably covered under fair use. And the Billy Graham one was uh, the reason that it was covered under fair use was um, that. Um, they do, didn't repli replicate the whole big concert posters who were like quite big, but have little images in their books. So it's really not the, not the same thing. Um, leaning away from fair use is again, um, if it's the heart of the work, if it's really the, the spoiler, so to speak, um, if the purpose is greater than what you need um, and uh, if it is uh, high resolution. Um, if it is also the whole work, usually um, this applies more to a literary work, to written uh, printed text. Um, if you copy a whole textbook, of course, that's not covered under fair use. If you uh, cover on, uh, if you um, uh, copy only part of it, then this um, may be covered under fair use. But in some cases, you have to uh, copy or you have to use 
the whole work in the case of a poster, for example, in the case of a photograph uh, that you want to include in your webinar, it doesn't make sense to get only a part of it. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. So you have to use it. So it's um, the amount of substantiality really, again, depends on uh, what you are intending to do and how you are, um, how you are using it. And the fourth factor is uh, an effect on a potential market. And that's, of course, uh, important. Um, so if there's no market for the work, um, then it's leading against fair use. And again, Billy Graham um, lost because, um, of course, there's no market for these posters. There, there, there's a market for original posters. They are collectible and probably quite uh, high price. Um, but there's no impact on the market if the publisher puts a little uh, copy of this uh, poster in their book. Um, the, uh, so the specified use does not affect the current market. So that, that's uh, important. And here I bring the example of the, of the uh, textbook again. So if you um, uh, copy a few pages for your students out of a textbook, um, that's fine. So nobody would, uh, would object. If you copy the whole textbook um, and distribute it to 20 students or 50 students in the class, so they don't have to buy the textbook, the publisher will probably be quite angry. And uh, then you can get in trouble. And I don't think anybody would, uh, would do this. Um, but uh, we do copy the whole textbook. But um, I, I mentioned this as, an, as an, one of the extremes here. Only. Um, leaning away from fair use, then, um, if there is a market value, potential market value, um, and uh, your attended use harms the market. So these were the four factors, and um, apply them, the four factors uh, of uh, for fair use. Um, apply them when you uh, publish, when you um, work with your students, when you prepare a presentation or a webinar, um, which is a presentation sort of, and, and, um, and be, um, be careful, uh, but also don't be too careful. So fair, fair use um, can cover quite a bit. Here's some information. The Authors Alliance is a nonprofit organization that provides information on copyright for authors, and they have booklets like this one here about fair use for nonfiction authors, uh, which you can download for free, and uh, it provides quite quite a bit of uh, good information and uh, clarifies a few is many, many issues here and many questions you may have. So leaning fair use um, is uh, when it's used for, uh, for criticism, commentary, and so on. Um, to support and prove an argument, I mentioned this, and non-consumptive research. Um, make sure that the amount is reasonable, appropriate, um, and uh, that the use of material is justified by what you want to do. Um, don't use it, use material just decoratively or to make it a little bit more fun or nicer to look or whatever, um, unless you can uh, you, you have a Creative Commons license, it is, it is open for use for everyone, uh, public domain or whatever. And um, then, of course, a very important reasonable attribution uh, should be given to the author of the material. That, that's also one thing that I should have mentioned earlier already because it's really important. Uh, you can use, under fair use, you can use material that is copyrighted uh, without permission but you need to give uh, attribution to the author of the material. So you cannot just, well, not only not pretend it is yours, that would be plagiarism, um, but um, the, this, this is not only best practice, it is also something that is simply expected by the um, by, uh, under fair use that you uh, give attribution and acknowledge the author. Um, so, for instructors, um, it is similar. Apply the fair use factors. Instructors here um, is also presenters. It's people like me who talk in a, in a webinar um, or uh, you talking at a, um, at a conference, for example. Um, but instructors um, in a stricter sense at the, um, in, uh, in, in the classroom, in the uh, in school setting, college setting, or whatever, um, 
there, there are some other issues that you can keep in mind uh, in order to make it more leaning toward the fair use. So certainly if you, uh, your students uh, are, or, or the material that you provide is limited to students in your, in your course, then uh, fair use uh, can be stretched quite far because nobody else has access to it and uh, only your students. And uh, if all the four factors sort of apply, you probably find. Um, use only what is necessary again. So this is, uh, always applies. Um, but you should also check for and rely on licenses if they are available. So um, instead of just copying something, check if your library has a license for this particular book or for this particular article or this image or whatever. Um, and uh, this brings you total, totally on the safer side. Um, take material down at the end of the course, so don't leave it out forever and certainly don't share it publicly. Um, and make students aware of copyright. That's also important that students learn about this because um, um, students sometimes uh, have the feeling they grow up in an, in an environment where they say, oh, it's on the internet. So it's on, it comes out of my computer so I can share it and it's free and whatever. It's not the case. Make, it's always good to let people know there is such a thing as copyright and it's a serious law <laughs> and um, they don't, uh, they should not share and they should uh, keep this, these restrictions uh, really um, in mind. Uh, one interesting aspect here, and I got this question several times in my, uh, as a copyright um, librarian, um, is if you, obey all these, these rules and, and uh, put something up uh, under fair use on a canvas or blackboard or whatever you use. Um, and you made your students aware, aware of uh, the copyright restrictions here, the coverage and the copyright. And the students nevertheless start to share this and put it up on YouTube or share it with friends all over the world. Um, then it's the student's problem. So it's not, you are not, um, uh, you're not liable for what your students uh, do um, if you made them really aware uh, on what, uh, what they can avoid and what they cannot do. And you can demonstrate that. So that, that's important. Um, attribute the uploaded resources. I repeat myself here. And then again, be reasonable, but don't agonize and then that what I what I said before so it's really up to the comfort level of the individual instructor or author or presenter on what they um, what what they want to uh, present what they want to use uh, without permission um, some people are more bold some people are not so much um, the uh, copyright uh, or the, the fair use give you, give you quite some coverage, um, but um, at the end of the day, of course, it's the um, person itself, the instructor, the author, the presenter, who has to uh, decide for himself or herself um, if they want to use this material. So that's also something um, to keep in mind. So you are, at the end of the day, you are alone. Um, but uh, people like me help you, try to help you to uh, find a decision and make a decision, but the decision um, has to be made by you. Um, one exception is here um, that uh, when you uh, publish, when you publish a book or an, um, uh, an article, your publisher might request that you either demonstrate it is really fair use or get permission. So the publisher is here, uh, basically the, the, the publisher's agreement or what the publishers demand um, uh, trumps basically uh, everything that I said before. So if they want to want you to come up with permissions for an image that you use in uh, a book that you want to publish, then you have to do it. Or um, in some cases you might not use it or um, you may be able to demonstrate that's under fair use, maybe an image of the public domain, uh, but publishers are very careful here and they um, are um, asking their, their, uh, their authors very often to, um, to, to bring permissions for, uh, for the use um, of material in a specific publications. And now a few words about protecting your own work. So um, 
Yes, the author owns the copyright. So you write something down, uh, you have a manuscript, uh, even if it's a sent written, um, it's automatically uh, covered under copyright. You're the copyright holder, unless it is transferred to a publisher. And, uh, and that's, uh, again, is something um, many publishers in the past requested. So when you write a um, publishing agreement, they want to exclusive rights and exclusive copyrights on the work. So that means that they, the publisher, only the publisher uh, can make copies, can distribute the work. Um, of course, that's how they make their, um, their, 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 not only their profit, but also a couple of operation costs and so on. So um, this was um, the case uh, quite, quite for a long time. And uh, sometimes it resulted in bizarre situation, situations. So um, an example is, uh, that we had a um, fallout with Elsevier at the University of California for a year or more, where we didn't have a, a subscription to the Elsevier journal, so we couldn't uh, access them. And our authors uh, kept uh, publishing, of course, with Elsevier. Um, and so there were sometimes situations where the author transferred the copyright and um, the the article was published by an, in an Elsevier journal, and the author, the UC author, was not able to see uh, and to access their own final works or the final version with the publisher's branding and so on, um, because we we didn't have a, a subscription or we didn't have an agreement with uh, with Elsevier. We have one now, so that an open access publishing agreement and open access publishing. Um, is uh, changing the situation of it because uh, many of these agreements that you see, uh, but also um, consortia, library consortia all over the world are making with uh, publishers about open access publishing. They include um, a part that um, requests uh, or that, that states that the authors retain the copyright, that the publishers get a non-exclusive right. So a non-exclusive right means they have a copyright, but the author retains a copyright as well and can do with their material what they want as well. So that's important. Situation changes you in that. Um, if your publisher um, has tried to um, so that you sign an agreement where you sign over the, the copyright, you can negotiate. So that's something that people did in the past and do today. Um, here is um, a link to a Spark author addendum. Spark is a nonprofit organization by libraries and, and uh, funders and so on. Um, uh, that um, is an addendum basically to a, a publishing agreement where um, you transfer only non-exclusive rights and it's to the publisher. And it's always worth trying it. Some publishers might say, no, I don't. And if you don't like our agreement, go elsewhere. Um, well, then you have to decide for yourself what you want to do. But sometimes publishers say, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, we can do this. I'm, I'm fine with that. So it's always um, uh, worth trying it. You can also register your copyright. Um, registering is not required. So again, once it is in a fixed tangible medium, uh, the work is uh, covered by copyright, protected by copyright. But if there is an infringement suit, if somebody is using your material without your permission in a way that you are not happy with and you want to sue the person, um, then uh, the registration of copyright um, might be previous registration um, might be quite useful because um, you can then uh, claim when, when it has been registered previously, you can claim attorney fees and you also can uh, claim statutory damages. So statutory damages are theoretical damages, uh, so to speak. So you can get a, a lump sum, uh, while otherwise you get only um, uh, damages paid that you can really prove that you have. So it's a, it's a much harder case. So um, again, this is uh, up to you if you want to do this. There's no, there's no law requiring it. Um, uh, but if you want to do it, do it through the um, US uh, Copyright Office. It costs, I think, $35, so it's a little fee, um, but uh, it's, it's relatively easy to do, and then there you are in the registry. Um, for an instructor, you can protect your copyright because you have, uh, and, and I have to um, say this is University of California. This might be different in 
other institutions, and especially if it is a, um, not a nonprofit or, or public institution, a private institution might have a different approach to that. But uh, here at the uh, University of California, uh, the instructor owns the copyright on their material, on the PowerPoint they present to their students, on the syllabi, um, uh, everything they, the, all the course material that they uh, create, including recordings and so on, uh, are owned by the instructor and not by the institution. Um, and you can do this by inserting the copyright statement. Uh, either you put the low C in there or the word copyright and the year and your name. Um, there, there are conflicting messages on, on, on different websites. Sometimes they say the name first and then the year, um, but it uh, really doesn't matter. But put this on, on either on each slide or at the beginning or at the end um, uh, states that is your, your copyright. And you can do this on printed materials as well. Um, and advert, uh, advise your students that this is protected by copyright. The course material is something they get from you, but it's your work and they are not supposed to share it or send it uh, around to put it on the internet or something like this. Um, but uh, when you're creating recording materials um, for a webinar, for a seminar, um, uh, presentation, whatever, um, you also need, of course, to attend the copyright of, of others. And that will come full, back full circle for is it covered under fair use and so on. So always <clears throat> keep this in mind. So yeah, again, that's the copyright statement. Uh, once again, um, that's a little bit too big. So you might want to do a more humble approach and put it in the left-hand corner down with a small font. Um, it doesn't really matter how big it is, but it's for demonstration reason. Um, so, and finally, uh, the last two slides um, are about obtaining permission. So if you um, want to use material and you are not sure, it could be, you could use it under fair use, or um, if you um, are quite sure you cannot use it under fair use, uh, you can uh, obtain permissions, of course. You're always free to do this. Um, that's a process that can be easy and it can be quite cumbersome. Um, the obtaining permission for obtaining permission, of course, you need to clarify who's the copyright owner first. Yeah, so you need to know this uh, in order to contact uh, the person or the agency or whatever. So for many publications, anything written, uh, and this applies to scholarly publications, uh, this applies to fictional works and whatever, um, it's usually the publisher. And the publisher, usually on their website, they have something um a, a, a part how to obtain permission to use our material and so on um for photographs um so that these are real photographs by professional photographers um, films music and so on uh the copyright owners are um often licensing licensing agents and this is because they the the, the rights in especially music and films is just crazy and uh you don't want to even start dealing with the individuals there. And the individuals don't want to start dealing with copyright. So it's all licensed to agents and they pay um, the uh, people who are involved there quite a bit. Um, these are, uh, especially films and music um, are, um, are areas where you have multiple, you can have multiple copyrights um, and layers of copyright. So in music, you have the composer of a song, you have the um, the, the person who did the lyrics, and then you have uh, a band or you have an individual musician who does the recording. And this could be, sometimes it's the same person, but they all did a lot of these things um, himself. Um, but um, very often it is like three different entities. And um, so the different layers here are, are quite complicated to uh, figure out. In films, it is even more so because there's a lot of creative people involved to make a film. Um, so these agents, however, they, they may charge fees. So that, and be aware of that. They might ask you for a fee. And depending on um, what you want to do, the, the fee might also change. So if you use it for just a presentation uh, at a conference, the, the fee might be rather small. If you want to use it for um, um, a presentation, 
that is being made public and available for everyone and potentially has a big uh, audience, um, this applies, for example, also to open access publishing, um, then the fees might be a little bit uh, bigger. And I had this case uh, a couple of months ago for um, an author from UC Davis wanted to publish a book into in open access with a, a, with a university press, and they wanted to use a, an image, and the image holder asked, so how many copies do you think you're going to print? And uh, the, the publisher said, well, we're going to do it in open access. And then they said, well, how many people will download this book? And they said, well, I, can, I don't know. It could be thousands of people. And uh, so they, um, they, they, they put the date, they made their fee accordingly. They requested a fee accordingly. Um, and finally, the author and the publisher said, I don't know, we use another picture. That's not worth the trouble. Um, so yeah, keep this copyright layers in mind with, uh, with films and music and keep the copyright layers in mind on uh, when you use articles, when you use copies um, from, from books, for example, um, because um, the, the image could also have a different uh, copyright holder. So the um, permission that are, that are being granted are usually for one specific purpose and um, for the purpose of publishing this particular article. So if you copy this article, you have another purpose and the copyright holder of the image from this article might not be happy about this. So keep the, the different copyright layers in mind. And then uh, here's some ideas and or, or some some advice what you should um, include when you request permission it should be in writing you should receive it in writing so in an email or a written letter um, down below is a template from the university of texas um, of a letter that uh, requests permission um, and you can you can use this uh, that's easy to do um, what if uh, the copyright owner is unresponsive or says no or you cannot identify the copyright order. Uh, so that's especially um, works that are still covered under copyright in theory, but like the, the company, the publisher, whatever, it's long gone. Uh, nobody knows who owns the copyright um, actually. Then it can be a little bit more tricky. In these cases, check if you have any fair use options or use alternative materials. Last but not least, there are a few links that um, we uh, that that you can visit if you want to uh, about um, copyright and for and, and fair use. Um, the Harvard pages are pretty good. Uh, they explain pretty well. We have at the University of California um, also some websites that uh, explain copyright and fair use um, to our um, our faculty and students quite quite nicely. So um, go there and check uh, or check your local. Um, uh, your local library. So, um, as I said, the questions come after um, after Eric has shown his slide. So I'm going to stop my uh, my presentation now. And I think Eric, if you want to take over, thank you very much. Um... I also want to add uh, there are a few questions of the links. We will send the uh, PowerPoints for distribution so um, you can get those links through the PowerPoint. I was trying to keep up with you, Michael, and send some links in the chat so people could follow if they wanted. Um, but you should have access to the, to the PowerPoints as well. Um, so I hope that answered at least one that one question. Uh, sorry. Okay, are you seeing my presenter screen or the? <laughs> yeah, the present the, pre the, the the right screen. Oh, you are seeing the right one. Oopsie. <laughs> no, no, now <laughs> just changing. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so this is just kind of um, again following up from uh, what Michael's talking about in terms of alternatives, or if you want to do things that are more for entertainment or um, less about. Um, learning value. Um, I just wanted to throw in some um, strategies in finding things that are under Creative Commons, which as long, again, the general idea is as long as you're not profiting from it, um, you can certainly use it freely, um, distribute it, and a lot of times change it, modify it somewhat, as long as you kind of mention it. Um, and of course, there's public domain. So 
I'm going to kind of quickly go through this because I know time is of essence here, but um, essentially I just want to show you there are places that you can go to use images for your slide presentations. These are kind of the alternatives um, to using copyrighted material, especially if fair use is in question, if you're not sure fair use might apply. So for instance, this is purely for um, entertainment. This doesn't get a major point across, but I think it illustrates making a decision, right? Um, and this is a public domain image um that um i got from uh the source of wikimedia commons and we'll talk a little bit about that um but finding uh creative commons or public domain images you can freely use the um, particularly public domain you can freely use these so i want to talk a little bit about um some sources some places you can go to find creative commons and uh, public domain images one of the places I like to go to pretty frequently is um, Wikimedia Commons, which you may or may not be familiar with, but this is a great place to find typically um, Creative Commons or public domain images. Uh, just make sure that, and this is true for um, Google as well, so you can also Google search for images and you can actually modify how you search for Creative Commons license. Just make sure that it is the original source that you're looking at, uh, particularly for Google, uh, when you're looking at these rights and whether or not you can reuse these images. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about um, potentially making your own images, utilizing um, uh, graphic design platforms. One of my favorite places to go is uh, canva.com, um, where if you want to recreate stats, for instance, because the actual data, the facts are not copyrighted, so you can create your own images in terms of tables and that sort of thing if you're not copying a figure or table directly um, you could build a lot of that stuff in canva and it also gives you a lot of images that you can use uh, freely and distribute um, because they are public domain or not um, copyrighted and um, recently you know take a look at different stock photo options that you may have access to that give different distribution um, choices um, sometimes like for instance if you're an academic institution library may license certain content um, always pay attention to the distribution or the light uh, to the use uh, uh, terms on these databases but a lot of times um, as long as you give um, uh, you know attribution um, it's fine to use these images uh, in your presentations. Um, Pixabay is one I just found out about, but I, it's pretty exciting too for using, again, um, typically uh, either Creative Commons or public domain images um, that, you know, it's always a good idea to cite on each page that you see these images, um, but you don't have to worry um, as much about uh, 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 getting permission. Um, and just to reemphasize what Michael said earlier, all U.S. federal government images are um, public domain images, uh, like the CDC has a website that um, hopefully I can share. Here's just an example, uh, for instance, of Wikimedia Commons. Uh, they will give you the licensing terms, typically with that image that's there, um, and whether or not it's, it's uh, Creative Commons. Um, or not, and then they also tell you how you would uh, attribute the author. So they give you uh, pretty much a thing you can just copy and put underneath the picture that you add in your presentation. So it's pretty much ready to roll. Um, the other thing I'm kind of becoming a fan of, and I just kind of recently added, is it's never a bad idea to kind of put uh, what type of image you're using. Um, so in the previous slide, I put this image here, which is representative of public domain. Uh, that there's no copyright. And I put this image here to represent that it's part of Creative Commons. Um, I didn't necessarily identify which, there's a lot of different Creative Commons licenses. Some are for, um, you know, you can freely distribute, you can freely modify, um, as long as you're not making a profit on it, it's fine. Some you can use for commercial use and do whatever you want with it. Some, they say, really, you can't change anything, you have to give attribution. Um, and you know, don't modify it in any way. So you do have to pay attention to kind of uh, what these Creative Commons licenses are. There isn't just one Creative Commons. There's a bunch of different uh, ideas behind Creative Commons or different ways that authors or copyright owners want you to utilize um, their images. Um, some are much more liberal. Others are, mm, I don't want you, I just want, you can use the image as long as you give me attribution and that's it. 
um, just to show you a Google search, if you do a search in images, um, you can always pop down to usage rights. And for instance, you can look for Creative Commons licenses or commercial and other licenses, which will often be, for instance, like a public domain where you, know, you can use it for commercial use or whatever. It's not under any copyright. Um, for the veterinary field, I did want to kind of talk a little bit about a few cool resources that I just wanted to bring to your attention that might make uh, presentations a lot more interesting and fun. Uh, one is the RCVS archive. Uh, that's where I got this image from. It's under Creative Commons because they did the work to digitize it and um, distribute this content. But essentially, you can just put all these images in. I just put the source that's under Creative Commons. Um, this is from 1683, a 17th century equine uh, uh, image. That's just a nice way to, to kind of add something to it. And it's OK to use because it's under Creative Commons. There are a few other places to look at, again, as alternatives. Look at open educational resources, which are always under Creative Commons types agreements. So like the ECLIN path, Ohio State Veterinary Histology um, sites and the complete um, and Arizona State actually did a really great job of creating a whole list of all OER resources in vet med that this might be very helpful for you um, in terms of using for your slides and your images. Again, you know, if if there's copyrighted content that has exactly what you need to get your point across, then, you know, it's where fair use supplies and you should use it. But in other cases, this is a great alternative way to look. Um, there's also, um, and I'm going to uh, just show you these images real quick, um, just to give you a sense. But there's also um, the Digital Pathology Association um, for specifically for pathology slides. And I apologize because the University of Zur Zurich um, actually had a very vet med specific one. Um, and I was looking to see if it was under Creative Commons, um, but unfortunately, it looks like it's no longer maintained. I'm following up with the University of Zurich to see um, if they've moved it or if it's something like that. Um, but currently, this one isn't being maintained, but this is a great place that you might be able to find slides or images for different um, um, uh, uh, diseases or that you want to use. But I just want to show that there are a number of different places that you can use that may be under Creative Commons license that you can reuse in your presentations and lectures and are pretty readily um, shared. Again, I'll have a list of these links. Um, I meant I'll throw them in the chat once I'm done. Um, but this is also, um, uh, the slides will be um, uh, distributed so you can uh, follow the links at your leisure. And then finally, um, I'm not sure if you're ones to do it, but um, if you're interested, um, there's also, for instance, music. You can't just use typically any music, especially for entertainment purposes uh, for your presentations, but there are places that you can go uh, to use Creative Commons uh, music for video webinar kind of presentations that you could do to kind of spice it up if you want a little soundtrack or put in some music in your presentations. Um, and then for videos, especially if you're linking out to like YouTube or anything like that, probably the easiest and best practice is to um, just put the link in your presentation and then follow that out as opposed to embedding. Um, this was just something I kind of recently was thinking about, but I think it's always a good idea to clearly show a symbol um, associated with this. Um, if it's copyrighted, um, I would put this is something I got from Wikimedia Commons. Admittedly, it's fair use. Um, it's an F in a circle is kind of a fair use idea, but it's just acknowledging that you're applying fair use for this copyrighted content. Again, it's an optional thing, but I thought it was kind of a neat idea. So it's acknowledging you give attribution, of course, and you acknowledge that you're applying fair use um, in that presentation. I will start sending out these links, but that's all I had. Um, so ready for questions and answers. Thank you guys. That was fantastic. And, and that's exactly what we needed. I really appreciate both of you. Can you see the questions at the bottom in the Q&A? Yes. And um, I think 
we can just go through them. Yes. Uh, starting with Taryn Donovan, um, who asked uh, if lecturing in a different country remotely, um, which copyright laws should be followed, those from which the lecturer originates or those from the country attending the lecture. Um, I, I would say the where, where the where the presenter is present present uh, so the the country where the uh, presenter resides or where the presenter is presenting from and not where the attendees are uh, the reason is because you are in this particular country and so you are under the jurisdiction of this country and not the country where um, your presentation will might be viewed um, so that that's that's the short answer. Um, then the next question: uh, Somebody was at the conference hosted by UC Davis, and the copyright transfer form needed to be signed from UC Davis. That was very heavy-handed in Burbage. Uh, yeah, the course instructor recommended presenters add a comment limiting the use of our presentations because many were uncomfortable with the terminology. How to best handle this? Ooh, yeah. So some, sometimes these um, release forms and agreements and stuff they are they're very um, have, have a lot of legal language. Um, and uh, I think the people who are creating these forms they copy from each other. And at some point, uh, somebody, some dumb lawyer, came up with this heavy language that. Um, that covers all eventualities for eternity, basically, and for the whole world, even if this is way overdone uh, for this particular um, event. Um, it's always good to try to negotiate, and often you can, and, and make an uh, amendment, an addendum, or whatever. At the end of the day, of course, the um, the organizer or the, the institution or whatever who puts this up um, is on the on the longer handle, so to speak, so they can they can say yes or no. Um, but if it's really unreasonable, um, heavy uh, to to put something uh, like an, a comment or something, I, I I agree with the exception of, for example, uh, that's something you can certainly do. Um, the entire list of links um, I. Put the list. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the, what the question means. I put the list of the links that I had of my last slide in the chat right now. So that that's would answer if the question was that. If the question is if you are in general can share a list of links, yes, of course you can. And uh, and I, I would say confidently yes because that's a um, list of facts. So links are just facts. There's no intellectual property in there. Um, and if you create a list of links for your webinar, for example, um, then um, you can share this at the end. I, I don't see any any issues here. Hey, Michael, I think I yeah. think if I got it right, I think actually what they want is, can you just give us a page of all the links, <laughs> like a, a Word doc or something? Um, you could always download the chat too, though. Yeah, I, I posted it in. Uh, I copied it in the chat, and um, again, I will send the uh, whole presentation, all the slides, to Rafaela, and she can distribute it. Then um, probably you have a way to do this to all uh, attendees. Um, then the next question: When you say for profit, you mean that someone is benefiting financially? I assume I ask because the Davis Thompson Foundation courses sometimes have a fee. And may have presenters using images from a textbook site. Right? Um, okay, so for profit means really, uh, I was referring to like for, for profit schools, for, for profit colleges, um, that you charge a fee to cover your cost for organizing the event, um, cover the cost for, yeah, for, for staff or for catering or whatever. That's not for profit. That is just like covering costs. So non nonprofit doesn't mean no fees. So nonprofit certainly can. So we have we have a lot of nonprofit journal, nonprofit publishers, for example, and they still charge a, a subscription because they have some cost. I mean, this is not throwing this out for just for the fun of it. Um, 
so I hope this answers the question. Um, well, I have seen, wait, now I'm confused here. Uh, and there is user. Oh yeah, if you use uh, some material in lectures uh, under fair use, do you still need to cite, make a reference? Yes, I would do this uh, always um, for two reasons. One is you want to acknowledge the intellectual work that somebody else has done. You would like to do this for your own work. So somebody is using your article and not uh, even mentioning you, it's probably, you will be probably angry. Um, so that that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is you want to avoid being accused of plagiarism, of course, because if you don't cite where, where this is coming from, people will probably assume this is your own um, image, this is your own um, intellectual work that is in there and uh, you, you don't wanna do this, of course. So cite, citing, always cite. Uh, I mean, it, it, there, there are rules for citing and, uh, but, but forget about them, it's, it, make your own rules, but, but cite the author, the year um, and, uh, and the title where you found it, that's important. Um, is distribution of some PDFs of journal articles that are uh, what to an online discussion group webinar open only to members of fair use? This is uh, again, one, that, one of the, it depends questions. <laughs> um, so if you share a PDF or two from a journal, um, and, and this is a closed group and nobody else can see it. And they are making it made aware that this is copyrighted material. I don't see much of an issue. If you, um, if you provide all the PDFs from a special journal issue uh, that you want to discuss, basically the whole journal issue, um, that would be a little bit overdone. And, and I, I would be careful doing that. Um, so it really depends again on the amount. Uh, it depends on if the articles are open access published or not, um, uh, how old the articles are. Um, so they're, they're all different kinds of questions. So this is not a straight uh, yes or no answer. Um, this is again about um, uh, applying the fair use factors, but certainly in uh, having this in a, in a closed uh, environment where only um, a few people have uh, uh, access to um, is, uh, is in favor of fair use, yeah. And then uh, Daniel asked the second question, I have seen conference talks in which presenters showed, whoops, this is moving here, so that, um, figures or tables from journal articles attributed to original source, is that fair use? Um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's what I'm, what I'm, uh, what I was talking about. So you can, you can use original articles or part of it. Um, if all the factors sort of apply, it's the, again, it's all I assume it's the academic context, uh, that's, uh, for fair use. Um, if it, um, is there any market harm for the publisher? Um, probably not very likely if you have a few figures or, or tables, nobody will stop the subscription to this particular journal because you made uh, five tables available publicly. Um, so uh, that, that's more leaning towards fair use. And the last question, um, can you comment on the use of information taken from textbooks and journals and use, use in diagnostic reports? Does this fall under for-profit information is intended for clinical education? Um, if the reports are um, published by commercial publisher and being sold, then this, this is sort of for-profit. And, and that's why the publishers, um, when they accept the manuscript, um, are often asking the author to either get permission for the material, for external material that they use, um, or make really, really clear why it is fair use. Um, because um, of course the commercial publisher is, is for profit, even if it is used for clinical education. And the textbook uh, publishers are even more so um, a, little, a little bit touchy on that because they always have, uh, for good reasons, they're afraid that people, students don't buy the textbook uh, if uh, material, 
um, is uh, distributed without permission uh, someplace else. Um, but here again, the, the third factor comes in as the amount uh, that is being used. So if you use a few pictures, um, a few tables, a few pages, even in, in the classroom, that's not hurting the uh, textbook sales. If you do have the textbook as a substitute for buying it for the student, then that, that might be a little bit too much. So it's always like, how likely is the, the and, and you have textbooks, you have textbooks that are really relevant to your field. So this, this is the textbook you need in biology or chemistry or whatever. Um, and, and the students probably need to buy it because there's so much in there that they need to learn. But then you, you might use textbooks where you need only a chapter because it touches on your specific uh, field that you wanna educate. And then you, it's unreasonable to ask students to, um, to, to come up with a quite amount of dollars for this textbook just for one uh, particular chapter. And they wouldn't buy it anyway. They would probably find some way to get around it. So um, that is more fair use friendly. Um, what are the copyright restrictions for distributing the link to the recording of this great presentation. Thank you for the great. Um, the, <laughs> uh, the restrictions, so I, my understanding is it goes up to YouTube um, or, or some other publicly available uh, accessible platform. And then you can share the link, of course. I'm happy to, um, I'm happy with that. Uh, I guess Eric as well. And um, so, if you want to share, share it. Yeah. So. <laughs> the good news is, yeah, as long as you share, you know, the link, and that's something to think about for presentations too, right? Michael, like, because you, you can always put a link to anything, <laughs> yeah. as you mentioned before, right? So, um, yeah, 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 share the link freely. <laughs> so, I think you guys, it, it seems that's all with the questions, but I, I have one more, if I may. Um, what, what's your what are your thoughts about, there seems to be two styles of acknowledging particularly images when you give a lecture. Some people put it on each slide and put the name of the owners. And some people, and I've done that in the past, put at the end a slide with thanks to and a whole list of uh, authors. Mm -hmm. Any preference there? I've seen both. Um, in, in uh, conferences and presentation webinars. So people do one way or the other. Um, to be really sure or really safe, um, put it on every every slide. Uh, make, you can just cut and paste. I mean, it's not that much um, of a hassle, um, but because you need to link anyway and, and, uh, and the description or whatever the author. Um, and then make, make it, can make it really small and, and in, unintrusive. Uh, yeah, so there's no no real rule, um, I would say, but um, yeah. I would say, you know, also like in terms of best practice, what I've, what I've noticed um, is that not only for the images, but also for the content per slide, um, a lot of times it's great to just kind of point out that source of information per slide, not just about the image, but where you're getting that information from um, or where those studies are coming from. I think it's always best practice to do it in the moment at the slide as opposed to a big collection of things at the end. I mean, it's similar, it's similar in, in a journal articles. So some, some journals require that you put the citation in the in text line. and I know journal require the style where you have uh, only the number and the references are at the end of it. So it's very similar, it's all over the place. Eric, one final comment for you. Thank you for all those uh, repositories of images that you mentioned because I'm sure many of the attendees today are pathologists, people most of them, are, I'm sure, are aware of the NOAA's archives. That, that's a repository of gross images that the foundation deals with, and that's for public use. And it's available, and it's on the website of the foundation. That, that's something else that people can use freely. Yeah, a lot of places. Yeah. And with this, I, once again, I want to thank both of you. Thank you very, very much. And thank you, Rafa, for hosting this seminar. 
and I'm sure we'll be in contact. We, we will have more questions guaranteed. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. It was great. Um, uh, I, I like in-person presentation more because you have a, yeah. you, know, you see somebody, but then we wouldn't have that, that big an audience probably. Yeah. But we were restricted to Davis more or less. So yes, yeah, thanks for having us. It was a, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you guys. And thank you everyone. Bye. Great. Thank Bye. you.